Huh? No, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see. Uh, uh, New York, uh, Berlin, Moscow, and uh, Tokyo. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm on it. Yeah. Bye. July 8th, 1944. It has been the big Soviet plan for months now. The big secret plan. But now it is unfolding for the world to see. The breaking of German Army Group Center. I'm Andy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Japanese laid siege to Henyang in China. The Americans advanced against the Japanese on Saipan. The Allies in general advanced in Italy and the Cotentin Peninsula, taking Cherbourg in the latter. The Soviets began a big battle against the Finns with German assistance, and the Red Army's utter devastation of German Army Group Center continued. The Soviets have now set their sights on Minsk. It it is obvious to everyone in German high command that this is not a localized operation, but the fighting in Normandy and Italy and the continued expectation of a Soviet offensive in Ukraine means there aren't reinforcements available for Army Group Center, and Minsk has to be defended with the locally available forces. Unfortunately, Hitler's refusal to permit an orderly withdrawal meant that most German forces pouring westward through Borisov and Minsk were disorganized stragglers, often unarmed and thoroughly demoralized. The 5th Panzer Division, backed by a variety of small units, holds the approaches to Minsk, but there are two Soviet fronts converging on it, with armor coming from three directions as the week begins. Since the 5th Panzer Division strongly defends the Moscow Minsk Highway, Soviet 29th Tank Corps and 3rd Guards Mechanized Corps from Ivan Chernyakovsky's 3rd Belarusian Front are heading through the forests to the north that are more lightly defended. 3rd Guards Tank Corps, backed by 11th Guards Army, are heading down the road, and 2nd Guards Tank Corps is approaching Minsk from the south. And that route is nearly undefended. Northwest of Minsk then comes a big clash of armor on the 1st and the 2nd between 5th Panzer Division, backed by the Tiger tanks of Schwere Panzer Abteilung 505, and the Soviet armor trying to surround the city from the north. This is fought here to keep the Soviets away from the railway line the Germans are using for evacuation. The armor battle continues all week, though, in dwindling intensity as the number of tanks dwindles. The Germans claim 295 Soviet armored vehicles destroyed, 128 of those by the Tigers. But their own strength is reduced from 125 tanks at the start of the week to just 18 today the 8th, when they are ordered to withdraw to the Northwest. I mentioned railway evacuation. Hitler actually agrees for once to evacuate a Festo Platz. See, as the week gets going, there were only like 1,800 armed troops in Minsk and they're not organized. There are also 15,000 or so unarmed stragglers, some 8,000 wounded, and 12,000 or so rear echelon Army Group Center personnel. They start demolishing city installations the first and evacuating the evening of the second. Second Guard's tank corps reaches the outskirts of the city that night at 2 a.m., and over the next few hours, as much infantry as can cling to the tanks as possible climbs aboard the 4th Guards Tank Brigade and they smash through the German defenses and into the city. On the 3rd, Soviet armor rushes the city from the north, northwest, and northeast. Later in the day on the 3rd, 1st Guards Tank Corps arrives from the southeast. So, the 3rd and 1st Belarusian fronts have surrounded Minsk and, and taken the city and this leaves a bunch of pockets of Germans isolated and trapped east of the city from division level size on down. The Soviet infantry, which arrives in the area in force over the next few days, will be eliminating these pockets as a main objective over the next two weeks. But there are tens of thousands of men trapped here. During the first week of July, the breakout attempts were well organized as many of the divisions retained a coherent command structure and the troops were still well armed. There were numerous skirmishes and battles as divisional groups of several thousand men each tried to move westward. By the second week of July, the lack of food or ammunition supplies forced most of the remaining German groupings to break up into smaller detachments. These units could forage their own food and were not as obvious to Soviet reconnaissance flights. However, they were small enough to be vulnerable to partisans. By now-ish, the large groups have all been either captured or destroyed. And spoiler, 
The partisans will comb the forest, as will the infantry over the summer. Of the 15,000 or so men of German 4th Army, then still surrounded in these pockets, only 900 will ever reach German lines. But it's not just 4th Army. The advance of the Soviets has been so rapid that elements of 3rd Panzer Army to the north and 9th Army to the south were also surrounded. Though some of those to the north do in fact break out and reach German Army Group North. Since Operation Bagration began, Germany has had 17 divisions destroyed and a bunch more badly hurt. They've lost somewhere between 300 and 350,000 men, of which 150,000 are POWs. The Soviets, too, have lost an awful lot of men, nearly 180,000 for the four attacking fronts together. But in less than two weeks, they have destroyed Army Group Center and destroyed more of the enemy than at Stalingrad. If you think they're finished attacking, however, then you are very much mistaken. Already June 28th, new orders went out to the front commanders. Since the fall of Minsk looked like it was in the cards, Operation Objectives moved further west to Kaunas, Grodno, Bialystok, and Brest. This would bring the Soviets into Lithuania and over the pre-war Polish border. Some commanders aren't enthusiastic about this, though, since their men are exhausted and supplies are running very low. But since it seems German resistance has collapsed, they are up for the task. They also know that the other planned Soviet offensives to the north and south are soon to go off, and that is going to help them big time. Walter Modo, who took over command of Army Group Center in the middle of last week, built, or tried to build, a defense line from Vilnius down to Baranovici using old Great War trenches to help flesh it out. He doesn't really have the manpower to defend this line, though, and there's still like a 75-kilometer gap between his group and Army Group North. And they've tried holding this all week as the Soviet mobile forces reach it and hit it. But today, the 8th, both Lida and Baranovici fall, which cracks the line. Hitler declares Vilnius another fester Platz, meaning it shall be held by at least one division down to the last man. And the 3rd Panzer Army forces defending it are hit by Soviet 5th Guards Tank Army on the 7th. By the end of the week, Hitler is turning down proposals to launch breakouts from the city, but it does still hold. But all week, the Soviet fronts are advancing 15 to 25 kilometers per day. 1st Baltic towards Kaunas, 3rd Belarusian towards Vilnius, 2nd towards Bialystok, and 1st towards Brest and the Western Bug. Something important, though. German High Command was not wrong that the Soviets were planning a major offensive against Army Group North Ukraine. They were just very, very, very wrong about when it was to go off. It is, in fact, to go off next week, just when Army Group Center has bled off many of its resources and has still been smashed. Ivan Konyev's 1st Ukrainian Front is the most powerful front in the Red Army. Seven Tank Corps, three mechanized corps, six cavalry divisions, and a full 72 rifle divisions, which is altogether over a million men and over 1,600 tanks. They also have nearly 3,000 planes, and remember, they're furthermore also supported by the mighty left wing of Konstantin Rokossovsky's first Belarusian front, only his right was used in Bagration. Yosef Harpe's army group North Ukraine facing them was about the same size, actually, until sending men and machines north the past few weeks. So he now has 900,000 or so men, 900 tanks and assault guns, and 700 or so planes. He does, though, have a good, strong, and deep defense system, like 30 kilometers deep in three main lines with five fortified defense cities. This is shaping up to be a serious fight, and we'll see how it starts next week. There is another Soviet fight this week still to cover. Now, the Finns were resupplied with thousands and thousands of German anti-tank weapons 10 or so days ago, and they've really beefed up their ability to resist the Soviet onslaught. Still, over the past few weeks, Soviet 7th Army has been pushing them back between Lakes Ladoga and Onega until by the end of this week, they're settling into the U line. This is a line from Pitcairantal running pretty much north that is to prevent an advancing enemy from swinging westward and hitting the Finns in the Karelian Isthmus from behind. They're not certain they'll be able to hold this line, so they've started another line behind it between Lakes Ladoga and Yanis. 
The Finns fighting on the isthmus itself get a bit of a reprieve this week, however. Well, okay, there are still Soviet attacks. 59th Army occupies the islands off Vipuri, tries a landing on the North Shore, which fails, and 23rd Army attacks the Vuoxi River bridgehead. But Leningrad front troops are mainly just regrouping, so the Finns have a little breathing and defense building time. By now, well, okay, the whole time, the Finns have been concerned about running out of manpower, something the Soviets don't seem to have to worry so much about. At the beginning of the month, Finnish commander Gustav Mannerheim asks Adolf Hitler to send him more men and more self-propelled assault guns. Hitler sort of dithers on this. He says he can build up the assault guns of the 122nd Infantry Division, who he sent over last week, until the guns are brigade strength, but... Mannerheim protested that in advising his government to accept the German terms, he had assumed a heavy responsibility. If the units were not forthcoming, not only would the military situation deteriorate, but his personal prestige and influence in the country would be destroyed. Hitler's response is to say he'll send a self-propelled assault brigade before the 10th, another one later on, tanks, more anti-tank guns, and artillery. One fight that seems to be coming to an end is that on Saipan. As July's first week unfolds, the Americans advance up the island to ever-weakening resistance, though still steady, but they've already taken the worst of the island terrain. On the 5th, with the Japanese holdup in the northeast corner of the island, Japanese 31st Army Chief of Staff Keiji Igeta sends a final message to Tokyo. He blames their situation on the lack of reinforcements by air and says they can't win without control of the air. And he ends with, We deeply apologize to the Emperor that we cannot do better. 43rd Division Commander Yoshitugu Saito orders the troops he has left to each take seven lives before they die in a gigantic suicidal charge on the morning of the 7th. The evening of the 5th, though, Saito, Admiral Chuichi Nagumo, and Igeta have their last meal. And they are all dead by noon on the 6th. Nagumo and his chief of staff shoot themselves. Saito and Igeta disembowel themselves according to ritual and are then shot in the head. Before the dawn, the 7th of July, the Japanese hurl themselves against the U.S. 27th Infantry Division. Defying machine gun fire, officers led suicidal charges brandishing swords, while others advanced with only knives and sticks. Even the wounded joined the attack hobbling on crutches. The sheer force and ferocity of the greatest bonsai charge ever made by the Imperial Army carried the screaming human tide over the mounds of bodies that piled up and through the American front line. Ultimately, it spent its force against scratch platoons of hurriedly round up cooks, typists, and base personnel. But that's ultimately, because it is a horror story for both sides from the get-go. The screaming mass hits two battalions of the 105th Regiment, overrunning them and just disintegrating them. The Japanese are killed by the hundreds, and everyone is running and screaming and killing and dying. The fighting spreads, and the Shermans of the 762nd Tank Battalion arrive, which helps the Americans, but really, the lack of any sort of organization among the Japanese sort of guarantees their eventual defeat. The 106 Regiment is sent in to relieve their comrades, and long story short, by the afternoon of today, the 8th, the attack has mostly sputtered out. Over 4,000 Japanese are dead, and at least 400 Americans. They need bulldozers to move the mountain of corpses into a mass grave. But though the battle for Saipan is over, the killing isn't. A few hundred Japanese manage to escape and swim out to the reefs. When American ships ask them to surrender, they open fire on the Americans and are in turn devastated. But even that's not it. See, the Japanese civilians have been convinced by the army that the Americans are coming to kill them. And the island is still not secure as the week comes to its end. And 2,000 kilometers to the south, there are allied landings of some 7,000 men the second on Numfor Island. They meet no resistance this day, though the skirmishing on neighboring Biak continues. On the third, they expand the Numfor beachhead and a parachute battalion is dropped into Kamaritz airfield. Now there are casualties, but they occupy the region. They take the Kornasoran airfield the next day. On the 6th, they take the 3rd Airstrip, Nambur. A much larger 
amphibious invasion was pulled off last month, and it still continues. As the week begins, a million Allied men are ashore in Normandy and 171,532 vehicles. Even in just a small area actually under Allied control, they have 41,000 German Army POWs. But still, by the start of this week, according to many people at Schaeff, the Allied armies were getting nowhere in the battle for Normandy. Apart from the capture of Cherbourg, the Allied front line had hardly moved since the beaches had been linked up June 12th, and some of the senior officers, most of them British, Tedder, Morgan, Conningham, were becoming extremely impatient with General Montgomery and critical of his methods. Even Supreme Commander Dwight Eisenhower is worried, but Nylans goes on to point out that it's not really true. They've carried out this massive invasion and secured the beachhead. They've taken a major port. They're blasting the enemy with airstrikes. And anyhow, the plan does not call for crossing the Seine for another two months. When the battle is calculated to last three months, is there any reason to cry stalemate after just three weeks? The reasons for not gaining more ground more rapidly are fourfold. The enemy, the supplies, the weather, and the bocage. And sure, this week does begin with an awful lot of troops still stuck in the Bocage, but new attacks all over are being planned. And for German commanders Erwin Rommel and Gerd von Rundstedt, this is no stalemate, but a battle of attrition that they cannot help but lose. The Allies have lost 61,000 men here, and those men have been replaced. German losses have been 80,000. They are nowhere near that in replacements. Once the Allies manage to break out of the Bocage in force, for that is the real killing ground, they'll be able to run down and overwhelm the enemy. They have more strength. They have more mobility. The Germans do have a quarter of a million men in 15th Army north of the Seine, but they still have not been ordered over. I mentioned last week that Rundstedt is relieved of his command this week, and he is replaced by Gunther von Kluge, of whom we've seen a great deal over the years. Kluge meets with Rommel, and they have hours of angry arguments. Then Kluge spends two days touring the front and realizes that Rommel's pessimism and dire assessment of the situation, well, they're accurate. He will allow Rommel to use Army Group B however he likes. The next phase of the battle begins this week. To the west, San Lu is the key to Allied success. The great road hub there and the open country to the south would lead the Americans into Brittany and the Loire. The Germans know this though, so it's a major defense point. So Monty's plan is to pin down the Germans in the British and Canadian sector while the Americans push south and then east and also take the Brittany ports. This general outline would sweep across Normandy to the Seine and would outflank the Bocage. This starts with the Canadians attacking again towards Carpiquet Airfield the 4th. Though they get onto the airfield, they can't take the strong points and they're driven back by the next evening. British 1st Corps, now 115,000 men strong, prepares for another attack on Caen today the 8th by three divisions. 3rd Canadian on the right, 3rd British on the left, 59th British in the center, backed by flamethrowers, artillery, armor, and heavy naval guns from offshore. The aim of Operation Charnwood is to take the part of the city north and west of the Orne. The night of the 7th, bombers come in and pound the city all night until 4.20 this morning when the ground attack begins. The fighting is extremely heavy all day, and though some small villages fall, Biron, Cusi, Resistance grows stronger and stronger as the day wears on, though Carpiquet Airfield finally is in Canadian hands and the attackers enter the outskirts of Caen. As for the Americans to the west, before they can break out, they must take saint Lou. And by the 3rd, Omar Bradley is ready for attack and breakout using all four U.S. Army Corps. And while the British are opposed by eight Panzer divisions in Panzer Group West with some 400 tanks, the Americans face 2nd Fallschirm Corps and 84th Army Corps with maybe 75. U.S. 8th Corps moves down the Coltentang coast to 3rd, hitting La Haye du Puy. The defense here proves tougher than expected, though, and the fight lasts the rest of the week until, spoiler, the ruins of the town fall for good at noon tomorrow the 9th. Montcastre is a similar story. Days of close fighting in the Bocage and the swamps before finally falling today. The terrain is just plain unforgiving, but some basic ground has been gained. Perhaps more will fall next week. But in Italy, more ground has been gained this week. 
On the 2nd, Foyano falls to British 4th Infantry Division. The next day, Siena falls to French Algerian troops. The same day, British 78th Division takes Cortona to the right, and the Americans reach Rossignano to the left on the coast. The Germans will spend July in Italy, falling back river to river, a few kilometers at a time. Speaking of rivers, on the 1st and the 2nd, Allied bombers drop 250 mines into the Danube near Belgrade. And the morning of the 2nd comes an air raid on Budapest, setting fire to the oil storage tanks in the refineries and killing hundreds of Hungarian civilians. The Americans also drop leaflets, though, that say the American government is watching the persecution of Jews closely and that all those involved will be punished. Hungarian leader Miklos Horthy tells the Germans that the deportations of Hungarian Jews to Auschwitz will stop. See, four escapees from the extermination facility have gotten enough publicity that the Pope, the Red Cross, even the King of Sweden have appealed to Horthy to stop sending people there. Hitler and company cannot really prevent Horthy from stopping it either, since it's Hungarian railway workers and Hungarian police who've been carrying out the operations. Over 400,000 Hungarian Jews have already been deported, but more than 170,000 are still in Budapest, and the order to stop the deportations goes out yesterday, the 7th. Citizens in allied nations are getting bombed too. In the first 16 days of Germany's flying bomb campaign ending last week, 1,935 British civilians were killed by the V-1 flying bombs. The bombs continued this week and alarmed the British chiefs of staff enough to divert bombers from the Normandy beachhead to flying bomb sites. On the 4th, a bomb storage depot underground saint Leu is hit. On the 6th, Churchill tells the House of Commons 2,754 flying bombs have been launched and 2,752 people have been killed. And that is the week. Continued Soviet success in Eastern Europe, the Allies having a tougher time in Normandy, and thousands of Japanese troops inflicting painful slaughter upon themselves. And there is also a plot afoot to kill Adolf Hitler by Klaus von Stauffenberg and some German army officers. Operation Valkyrie. The first plan is to take out Hitler, Himmler, and Goering at Berchtesgaten this week on the 2nd. But Hitler is alone that day, as it turns out. Stauffenberg goes there the next day, and inside Hitler's headquarters, he is given by General Helmut Stief, chief of organizations at OKH, a bomb with a silent fuse that fits into a suitcase. Stauffenberg's plan now is to use it the 11th when he returns to Berchtesgaten. Hitler might be in great danger. Here's the thing. When the Red Army took Bobruisk late last week, Winston Churchill wired Joseph Stalin. This is the moment for me to tell you how immensely we are all here impressed with the magnificent advances of the Russian armies, which seem, as they grow in momentum, to be pulverizing the German armies, which stand between you and Warsaw, and afterwards Berlin. Every victory you gain is watched with eager attention here. I realize vividly this is the second round you have fought since Tehran, the first of which regained Sevastopol, Odessa, and the Crimea, and carried your vanguards to the Carpathians, Sereth, and Pruth. The enemy is burning and bleeding on every front at once. And I agree with you that this must go on to the end. And so will we to the very end of this madness, together with all of you in the Time Ghost Army who allow us to do this. Join the army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com to be part of this adventure. These are the newest army officers. The army officer, army officer, army member of the week is Stefan Mosier. And if you want to see an episode about Hitler putting himself in danger long ago, you can check out this Between Two Wars episode about the Beer Hall Putsch. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.